All right, Luke chapter 6, beginning, we're going to begin in verse 1 this morning and read 1 through 11. <clears throat> one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were, fu but they were furious and began, and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. If you are just joining us for the first time this Sunday, or if you've been here and need a little reminder, we have been working through the Gospel of Luke really since mid-November now, and we are in chapter 6, so we are you know, just moving at an incredible pace uh, through the Gospel of Luke, but that's okay. Uh, and this morning we have this wonderful story of Jesus uh, healing and doing some wonderful things here on the Sabbath. Uh, but before we talk a little bit about that, uh, I just, you know, one of the good Christian practices that we have uh, as people of faith is uh, confessing our sins to one another. And so this morning, I need to confess uh, a few sins with you. And that is, I need to confess that sometimes I break the law. Okay, now, uh, I know that might be a shock to you all, and I know we also have a police officer in the building, so... If I'm Zooming from jail the sermon next week, you know what has happened. Uh, you might be asking, well, well, how do I do that? Well, um, if you live in this neighborhood, you might be aware of the intersection of Riverwood Drive and Gallatin Road, okay? If you're not familiar with that intersection, you probably have one of these intersections in your neighborhood or where you live. But if you are familiar with the intersection of Riverwood Drive and Gallatin Road, uh, then I guarantee you're probably familiar with the stoplight there that likes to have this iron grip on who can exit the neighborhood, okay? Uh, it seems to me, in my humble experience, to be quite partial to the people on Gallatin Road, and it's like a dictator over the people, the humble people, trying to exit uh, from Riverwood Drive on there. Uh, if, you, if you find yourself, maybe you leave here today and go uh, out to your home on that way, I just want to make sure that you know that you need adequate snacks to pack. Uh, you might need a pillow to take a nap while you're waiting uh, at the stoplight there. And maybe you might even need a good book because you're going to be there for what feels like hours. In fact, this week I noticed a few more gray hairs on my head. That's not from my job here. That's not because, you know, I'm doing anything wild. It's because I have spent most of my life waiting at the intersection of Riverwood and Gallatin Road, okay? And so, because of that, I sometimes break the law. Sometimes I will get up to the, to the intersection and I'll look to the left, and I'll look to the right, and I'll look to the left again, and to the right again. I'll get out of my car and look around and make sure everything's okay, and then I run the stoplight, okay? I just want to confess it here openly before you all. And I do this, and you might be thinking, Paul, how do you sleep at night? How do you handle yourself with this crushing guilt of running the stoplight? I know, I know. The way I tell myself, the way I justify it is this. I know that the law, the purpose of the law, is to make sure that we have good, safe, well-traveled streets, right? That's the, that's the reason we have the law. 
and the stoplight is preventing that from happening, right? I'm trying to get where I'm going, and it's not letting me. And as long as it's clear, I think I can bypass the law a little bit and go out onto the road. Now, this is the part of the uh, sermon where I have to put the fine print. If you're watching, if you're here, do not do what I do, okay? I can't endorse what I'm doing, but what I'm saying here is that because of the fact that sometimes I have to eat a full breakfast in my car while I'm waiting, that sometimes it's okay to bypass the law if you know the intent of the law. Okay, that's a terrible analogy. Let's get into our, let's get into our text this morning. My point, though, is this. That laws are in place to accomplish a greater purpose, right? To make sure that our streets run safe and smoothly. And sometimes the, the whole point of the law is not necessarily the law itself, but it's the purpose behind the law. And that is what I think Jesus, one of the things that I think Jesus is getting at this morning, okay? As we look into our passage here in Luke chapter 6, uh, Luke gives us a couple really important things to pay attention to. The first are those details there in verse 1 and verse 6. That this, what's about to happen in the story, is taking place on the Sabbath day. When you hear that, when you see that Sabbath day, that should be a clue to you that what's about to happen, what's wrong with it, is not what is happening. It's not what is taking place that's wrong. It's when it's happening that is doing the harm to some people. Specifically, that things are happening on the Sabbath day. If you're not familiar with what the Sabbath day is, that's okay. We don't really practice it much today in today's time. Hardly at all, really. Uh, so I just want to give a quick, super general review of what the Sabbath day is. The Sabbath day uh, is something that God wove into the fabric of creation and in the rhythm of the world. I get that statement from Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. We're in the, at the end of the creation narrative there in chapter 1. It says this at the beginning of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Culminating at the end of all of God's created work there in chapter 1, we see that God set apart a day of rest and celebration and blessing. It's a day of recognizing and being grateful for all that God has accomplished. It's a day, as you heard again and again in that first passage, that he rested, that God rested, that God rested. Uh, therefore, Jewish cult culture has set apart a day of rest and worship uh, throughout its history, a day of celebrating what's called the Sabbath. The Jewish rabbi Abraham Heschel wrote about how every religion has sacred spaces, that we all have sanctuaries and we have temples, we have meccas, we have places of sacred space, but it's, it's only in Scripture do we see that God has also operates and creates, not just in sacred spaces, but in sacred times as well. And we see that in this first story that we are designed not to be people that work all the time, but to have an intentional rhythm of work and of rest. Uh, we always talk about, well, how many hours did you work this week? But we never talk about, well, how many hours did you rest this week? I think we need to reclaim that practice myself personally. So the first thing to know about the Sabbath is that God wove the Sabbath day into the fabric of creation and the rhythm of of the world. The second thing is that the Sabbath is not the same as a day off, okay? Uh, it, is, it is a day off, but it's so much more than that as well. It's not just a day uh, to, not, to just not work, but, uh, but still treat it like any other day. But specifically, it's been seen as a day of worship, a day of coming together with a church family or, or uh, coming together and worshiping in your own home. Having a little extra time of prayer, perhaps, or having a day where you sing a song together as a family. Uh, it's specifically seen as a day of resting, of restoration. It's a day when you need to think about, what is it that gives me life, and how can I go and do that? For me, maybe that looks like taking a little extra walk around the neighborhood, because that gives me life. It's not just about uh, not working, it's about thinking about those things that allow us to cultivate and kind of reclaim our souls on that day. 
And finally, for us in the New Testament, observing the Sabbath is not a command. It's not something that you have to do. It's less about being a command and more about just the wisdom of the world and the wisdom uh, of how God created things. In Exodus and the people there, God does command them to follow the Sabbath. It is definitely a command and it becomes something that marks the Jewish people as different from everywhere else. Other cultures, we have writings actually from other cultures like the Romans and others that would come and write about this, this people group that doesn't work, this lazy people group that takes this day off. It was a marker to set them apart from any other people group that they're around. And it's something that Jesus observed. As we've been journeying through Luke, I hope you've picked up and noticed how many times it talks about Jesus going into the synagogue on the Sabbath. How Jesus, uh, it's a regular part of the rhythm of his life, is observing the Sabbath. But in Scripture, God gives very little detail about how we should actually observe the Sabbath. He doesn't say in many, in many places, you are to do this and not do this. It's pretty general overall in Scripture. And because of this, over, the, over uh, thousands of years, different rabbi, uh, rabbinical traditions arose to attempt to interpret the Sabbath to give guidelines on what you should do and what you should not do. And because of this, a huge number of laws and rules and regulations started being the thing that kind of framed the Sabbath. Which is why in the story, Jesus' apprentices are uh, in their action of plucking the grain off and rubbing it between their fingers, separating the part you don't eat from that which you do. Pharisees see that and get on to them. And they accuse them of working on the Sabbath. Now guess what? That's not illegal in Scripture. In fact, in Deuteronomy it says that they're able to do this. But they, give, they get on to them because it's considered work on the Sabbath. You won't find it in Scripture. It was a part of their tradition and their laws. And so Jesus responds with that, that story from 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, he says, have you not read? Which in Jesus speak, I think that's a little, it might be a little sarcastic even because these are people that in many cases, have it memorized. So when he says, have you not read, I think he's kind of getting on to them a little bit. And in the story, he's talking about this story where David, the king uh, of, of Israel, who's been just anointed as king, uh, and he's been anointed as king in place of Saul. Saul, though, he doesn't really like this because he's the current king, and therefore he's been chasing David around, trying to eliminate him. And so David is on the run with his men. And because he's on the run, he gets to this place where they don't have any food left. And so they get, to the, they, get to, uh, this, they get to where they're going, and the only food that's available there are the 12 loaves of bread that sit on the altar uh, to eat. And there's, they're there for only the priests to eat. You're not supposed to. No one else, it was lawful for anyone else to eat those. But because David was desperate, he went in to the house of God and ate of the bread. And guess what? God doesn't condemn him. God didn't get upset at him. God doesn't say anything against that at all. Uh, and so Jesus, looking at this story, uh, tells them that their tradition isn't what determines what is appropriate or not. In fact, it is he himself who determines what is appropriate on the Sabbath, not their tradition. Jesus, not tradition, is what matters. Now this obviously doesn't sit too well with the Pharisees. As we're told in the next story that when the next Sabbath or another Sabbath came along, they showed up just looking for trouble. They showed up just waiting to find some way that they could get on to Jesus for doing something that broke their law. And so Jesus, knowing this, you've got to be careful what you think around Jesus, uh, it says that he asked the man to stand up who had a withered hand. Now the Pharisees, they aren't against healing. They're good with that. They have no problem with healing, but they had this law that said if it's not a life-threatening disease, then save it for the next day. Don't do it on the Sabbath. You don't need to be healed on the Sabbath. Wait till the next day. Uh, now Jesus looks beyond their law, though, and he says, that he looks beyond the intent of the rule they have set up and said, what is the intent, what is the purpose of the Sabbath? What is lawful or appropriate of the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, to save life, to sozo life, those of you that were here a few weeks ago for that, that sermon, uh, that the Sabbath was here for a day of healing and saving and making whole, not a day to destroy life. And especially for the Sabbath, which points us back to the Garden of Eden and God's purpose there of, 
of rest and creating the Sabbath for humanity. And the Sabbath points to how we trust and rest with God now. And it points forward to the day when God makes all things new. Jesus is saying here, I believe, do not confuse the rules, the tradition, the do's and don'ts of religion for the purpose or the intent or the why behind why we do what it is that we do. Because what's most important to me, I believe Jesus is saying, is the why. It's the why. Why we do what we do is always the most important question we should ask. Tradition, our traditions that we even have here at Brush Hill or in your families or you yourself is important. I'm not saying it's not. It's excellent as long as it passes along meaning well, right? Tradition, the point of tradition is to pass along meaning. It's to pass along the why behind why it is that we do what we're doing. And many times we just throw out tradition in the name of progress. And I think that's not the way to go. We think things can be done better and so we just want to leave the tradition behind. But I don't think that's always a good thing. But on the other hand, sometimes we can get in trouble uh, when, we, uh, when the way things are done uh, replaces the purpose behind why we do them right? The way things are done replace why we do things. The classic example of this is the pot roast story. Y'all are probably familiar with the pot roast story, right? A girl comes to her mom and says, mom, why do we always cut the ends off the pot roast? And her mom says, well, I don't know. That's what my mom always did, right? And so they say, let's go call grandma and talk to grandma. And so they call grandma and ask her, uh, grandma, why do you cut the ends off your pot roast? And grandma says, well, I don't know. That's just what my mom did. And so they say, well, let's call great-grandmother. She was probably named Ethel or something. I don't know. But they call, they call let's just say Ethel, and ask her, why, did you, why do you cut the, the ends off the pot roast? And she says, well, when I got married, our oven was too small to fit the pot roast in, so we had to cut the end off. And now, and so looking back, that's the whole reason why we've gotten rid of a perfectly good end of pot roast. Over time, sometimes a wonderful tradition, uh, we lose sight of why it is we do what we do, and all that matters is just that we do it. The what we do replaces the why behind we do it. Why does this matter, I wonder? Well, here, uh, one of the things I think, reasons why it matters, because we go through changes in life. We go through changes personally in our own personal life. Together as a church, we go through changes. And I think it's important for all of us to embrace tradition insofar as it aligns with Jesus and that we have a good grip on why we do what we do. Uh, many times uh, when, we have, when we've had lock-ins here in the past, the students will want to come running into the sanctuary with uh, drinks and uh, all kinds of food and things like that. And I'm like, well, let's, you know, hold on, hold on. And they see the sign that says, no food or drink. And I've had to tell them, wait a minute. And they get upset at that. And I say, look, here's why that's important. Here's why we want to set apart kind of this area a little bit uh, from doing things that we normally do. Uh, we might find that as we go on, some traditions are good and we should hang on to them and really work on are we passing along the meaning well. Uh, and sometimes we might find, like the moms in that story, that we've done things a certain way just to do them a certain way. And as we see in this passage, we have to be careful uh, that we don't miss out on what appears to be a really good, pious tradition and yet miss the heart of God. Miss the heart of God. I thought all week about these Pharisees in this passage. And I thought about, you know... How did they get to where they got to? How did they get to where they're so concerned with the way things are done that they miss out on a man who is in need? That they, that they would condemn disciples for taking care of their hunger on the Sabbath day, a day to celebrate God's gifts to us. How do we get there? And I want us to be sure that we're mindful of all our tendencies to have that attitude and the heart posture of the Pharisees as opposed to the, to the attitude and the heart posture of Jesus. Uh, and so this morning, I want us to have a little heart checkup, uh, a, little, a little heart uh, a checkup in determining what kind of heart are we operating out of. And so I have a few things here, seven, in fact, that I kind of want to run through. And a lot of these have come from my own heart, okay? So I want to I not present this as I have it all figured out. These are things I have to work on myself. The attitude and heart of a Pharisee might sound a little bit like this. 
You can get caught up on enforcing the do's and the don'ts of the rules rather than knowing and teaching the purpose behind the rules. Uh, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? The rule is what's important, not the knowing and the teaching of the purpose behind the rules. You might find yourself wishing people acted a little bit more like you, and you get frustrated when they don't, right? Uh, we would never pick grain on the Sabbath. We would never do it like that. Number three, you are far quicker to criticize people and be skeptical of things that you don't totally understand rather than compliment and encourage them. You're far quicker to criticize and be skeptical than to compliment and encourage. Number four, you automatically assume people have bad or wrong intentions. Uh, when people don't do something right, you have automatically assume people have bad or wrong intentions. And you approach with preconceived assumptions and are ready to correct them. Number five, you avoid wrestling with the tough questions by saying things like, well, that's just how it is. Number six, you keep your distance from those people, whoever those people might be, uh, who are far from God and far from your way of life in the way you believe things should be. And finally, number seven, and I borrowed this from someone else, you hold yourself and others to a higher standard than even Jesus does. You hold yourself to a higher standard than even Jesus does. On the other hand, a Jesus attitude, by contrast, I think sounds a little bit more like this. You focus on understanding and teaching the purpose and the meaning behind why things are done the way that they're done. The why is the most important. As Jesus said in another gospel about the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. The purpose is to bless humanity, not enslave humanity to it. Number two, you recognize and are okay with the fact that not everyone is going to act like you or do things the way that you do things, and that's okay. Number three, you're quicker to compliment and encourage others than to criticize. It doesn't mean you're naive to what's broken and ugly and needs to be fixed in the world or within the church or within people, or that there isn't a time for correction. Certainly not. There's a time when we need to correct people. But your default posture is to help and to encourage. Number four, you assume the best intentions of others. You approach people and situations with a spirit of curiosity and a posture of listening. You don't go in guns blazing looking for a fight unless you're playing laser tag. All right? Number five, you embrace those asking hard questions as a desire to learn more to go deeper and to find meaning. You're okay honestly saying to someone, I don't know the answer, but I will go with you as we try to find it together. This week I talked to one of my former students who, after he graduated, uh, spent some time away from Christianity. Uh, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't a Christian. He called himself an atheist, and that's where he was. And uh, he has since found his way back to the faith. And I was asking him about that this week. And he said, one of the things he said struck me. And he said, I was asking a lot of questions. And people couldn't give me a lot of answers. And they didn't want to, they didn't want to seek those answers with me. And therefore, I just went away and had to find them on my own. And I thought that was telling. Number six, you make the choice to embrace those far from God. And not reduce a complex human to a single issue or stereotype or story about them. You make the choice to embrace those far from God and not reduce a complex human to a single issue or stereotype or story about them. And then finally, number seven, you recognize your sin, but you embrace and rest and bask in the grace of Jesus given for you and all people. You recognize the fact that none of us can live up to the standard that we so often hold ourselves to. But all of us need the grace of God. That is the heart of the gospel. And my friends, all of us have these tendencies within us. And in fact, I dare say, if you sat here as I read these two lists and thought, oh, I hope, I hope so-and-so is listening to this list, then you need to stop and go back and think about it for yourself 
That, I think, is the heart of Jesus. Not that we look and blame other people, but we start with ourselves. The best way, y'all, that I know how to smash the heart of the Pharisee in all of us is remember that we are loved and accepted and embraced by God, not by what we do, not by how good or righteous we think we are, but instead we embrace the goodness and the grace of Jesus. We recognize the love of God. We recognize that we are saved, that we are healed, that we are made new because of what Christ has done. As it says in Romans chapter 5, while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In 1 John it says, we love because he first loved us. And that is why, and this is why the the Sabbath is truly important. Because it is a reminder when we don't work, when we don't seek to uh, put ourselves out there as being this good, awesome, righteous person who has it all figured out and look down on others, it is at the heart of God that we all need Jesus. And so if you found yourself this morning maybe leaning a little bit more to one side of that list than the other. I just want to invite you once again uh, to, the, to receive the heart of God, to receive the, the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus as we're going to take here in a moment, and to rest, to rest in the grace of Jesus that was given for you by our Lord and Savior. That you don't have to come to God uh, with it all figured out. You don't even have to come with it anywhere close to having it all figured out. But even still, God loves you and embraces you because of what Christ has done for you. May God always put before us the why behind what it is that we do. And may we all find ourselves working on those those tendencies within us uh, to be a little bit more like the Pharisees. And have God replace it with a little more of his heart for us. Amen. Let's pray.